Well, thank you all for being here uh, this early in the morning and um, to listen first someone who is not someone from the industry and someone who is not a lawyer, right? So <laughs> we started maybe uh, off the wrong uh, foot. Um, but let me try to convince you that maybe there is a link on, on with gaming and with law and particularly IP law. So. You may not know what this is, but this is the TK85, which was a computer you could get in the mid-80s. And my dad, a lawyer, so there is already a connection there, brought this home and says, OK, you play with this, right? Enjoy and so on. And of course, because incentives matter, he did this. He bought me a book with games to code. And with those uh, coding in BASIC, I could play games with this uh, playing. And of course, by, by uh, entertaining myself with this, more and more, I uh, basically developed a lot of skills of coding, skills that were very useful for me as an economist to do uh, econometrics, to do simulations, and to do the methodology I'm going to explain in a minute of the report. But why this is relevant? Well, we economists, we make a big, especially innovation economists, we make a big deal that knowledge can be transformed into technologies and then it can be embodied in a product, right? This is the case of the computer here, right? We have embodied technologies in something that we can export, we can send around, we can buy it and so on. Also, there is some knowledge that we can codify, right? In a book, in code, right? In, in, in scripts uh, and share in a patent as well. And we can share it as well, so it's relatively shareable. But in, by using the two together, you need individuals that have tacit know-how. Right, that they incorporate ways of decode this codified knowledge and apply it also, eventually even produce new embodied technologies. And this is very relevant, right? The skills, the know-how of people are at core of what we do, and they're at core, I will say also, on the intellectual property and definitely the laws related to that and the gaming industry. So, myself, another economist, we worked together and we came with this methodology, right? And we wanted to measure these skills. We wanted to measure this know-how. And for doing that, we basically went through millions of records of scientific publications, millions of records of patents, right? In, um, and trillions of dollars of exports of goods, right? And we tried to have a methodology that was allowing to map the capabilities. We, we came with 606 capabilities, which are summarized like this, right? This is the innovation capabilities space, and there you have capabilities that are related to production, technology, and science. You see this map and says, okay, why I woke up in the morning so early just to see this that I don't understand why. So let me step one step uh, back, and we're gonna rely on one of the contributors uh, to the report. Another contributor is actually here, Hakan will speak after me, but Professor Ricardo Hausmann, who is the director of the Harvest Growth Lab, and who has a large experience in working with what he calls economic complexity, uh, he helped us explore this method to what we call innovation capabilities. He has a beautiful metaphor, also related with games, not video games, but traditional games, that I would like to bring you, because I think it's very powerful to understand what's going on. So he called this the Scrabble theory of economic development, or it could be the Scrabble theory of capabilities. So most of you have played Scrabble, and if you have only one letter, you probably can do only one word, right? And, and it has to be even one specific letter in this case, right? You can do the A. If you have three letters, you can do already four words. If you have four letters, you can already do nine words. And if you have 10 letters, you can do almost 600 words. In English, of course, depends on the language and so on. Why this matters? Well, this can be a nice analogy of capabilities, right? The letters are capabilities, and the products, the technologies, the science that we do are the words that we can form with this. Of course, the more letters you have in your rack when you play Scrabble, the more words or the more sophisticated words you can actually do, and this is what we uh, say. And basically, he argues that places have different racks, and this has to do with development. We argue in the report, with him as well, that actually those places can be even more generic. Basically, a company has a certain quantity of letters, of skills, uh, and an organization, an university, but also regions, clusters, and certainly countries. So with this, we come with uh, another important concept here, which has to do with innovation complexity. Depending on the letters that you have, and we know that the letters in Scrabble have different values, you can do different things. And this means that we can have an organization where every single member specializes and becomes very good 
at one ledger, or you may have smaller organizations where people have to accumulate more skills, right? And, and then they cannot go deeper, so they cannot get the same level of sophistication, right? So basically, in the same analogy, you will have a symphonic orchestra. They can be very sophisticated, and every single of them very specialized. Here you have one person accumulating three ledgers. So we come back to this. These are the ledgers, right? Countries may have or not these ledgers, and they may be able to combine them in different ways. Look at this, very clear example. We have, an, let's say, a very functioning innovation ecosystem, Australia, they accumulate all of these ledgers. Look at Bolivia, they accumulate much less ledgers, barely ledgers, and all of them from the productive case, right? So they cannot uh, basically fully exploit their possibilities because they need to acquire more ledgers in order to play this innovation capability scrabble. And this also allows us policymakers to look at the same thing, but in the dynamics. Look at China in 2004. They have more letters than Bolivia, but they were probably about the same one or a little bit equivalent to Australia. Look at China now. And more importantly, look at China on the dark blue ones, which are technologies which are basically coming from patent data. Look how much more sophisticated they came on this. And this is a point I want to make, apologize, this is a chart that was very hard to, to place it, but here you have basically all the same 626 capabilities mapped. Uh, they are grouped in, in basically what we call the domains, so some big families, but also they are grouped by if they are scientific, technological, or productive. And here you have a rank of complexity, meaning one is the most sophisticated of the capabilities, 626 is the least sophisticated one. Sophisticated here being that basically oh, uh, only a few countries can actually do this, and they can do it also because they have other sophisticated capabilities. Not surprisingly, the technological capabilities are the hardest to obtain, right? You have always some variability here, right? Uh, you, you have scientific fields that are less sophisticated than some productive fields, and vice versa. But the technological ones, they seem to be the hardest ones to get. So the fact that China actually went all the way there means a lot. So how this relates for us policymakers? Well, first, very quickly, two examples. We'll have two case studies that are less interesting for this crowd. One is motorcycles. And you can see that Italy and Japan, from relatively related capabilities, they build the motorcycle industry. Uh, but you can also build new capabilities. We see Kenya, Brazil, and US. From agriculture, they build very different paths of technologies, one of them even being ethanol or the food industry in the case of the United States. But this is the one that probably will interest you the most, right? And this is the point I want to make here. We, in, in the study, we look at the video game industry and we analyze four hubs. One of them, of course, very dear to this town because it's the Apple House uh, hub. And we can see that in the video game industry, uh, the capabilities that were used to generate the video game industry were very diverse, were not exactly the same, right? In the United States, we see that there is, of course, an influence of semiconductors and computers, but certainly Hollywood. In the US, there is an influence of, of course, again, highly technological, but also multimedia, manga, anime, and so on. In the case of Poland, that I, I don't need to explain you, you know better than me, uh, it has to do with the, the great, literally, work that existed, translation and adaptation, and also distribution of games. Finland, they had a young community of coders, and also the mobile phone industry, all of that. Of course, a simplification, there are many more, which I'm sure JP will add to this, and certainly Hakan will explore a bit more. But this tells us something about the capabilities. So let me reach the point that maybe interests you. We know in the, in the industry that basically the team size per game is growing up, right, and dramatically going up. This means that games are becoming more sophisticated, more complex. You need to bring more people in, um, and definitely more skills, because also the roles of the games are also going up, so the average one. So you cannot do, it's not true, it's not me with my basic uh, spectrum doing a game, right? It's very sophisticated games with designers, artists, coders, etc., etc., etc. So this is translated also to patents. These are the patents related to video games, and look how they're going up. And this one is not the absolute numbers. This is, in, is the share of the global patenting, which means that video games patents are growing faster than the average patents of the world. So they're going really, really fast. Uh, I don't know how aware you are, but patents are growing all the time in general, right? Not only the video games. So that means that they're going super fast. If we go to trademarks, we also get an interesting picture. They're also growing very, very, very fast. But also look also how many, what we call the niche classes grouped here by certain groups. 
how diversified they are. So historically, they were way more about what we we'll call the traditional niche classes for video games, which goes in leisure and educational goods. Uh, however, more and more, we observe that they are diversifying to other things. For instance, particularly other goods and services which are here are packing up. This means that video games companies are becoming very sophisticated in how they use the, um, their, their, their portfolio of IP. And well, we have obvious examples, right? You, you go to one of the platforms that you can see more and more uh, TV shows or movies being issued from video games. But that's not the only way, right? There's merchandising, marketing, etc., etc. OK, to wrap up. Building a vibrant innovation ecosystem, uh, we claim in our report, and I invite you all to, you to, to look at it, uh, is, is important to understand the complexity and the skills and the capabilities of the ecosystem. By understanding, you can design better policies, which means that we, I didn't explain this here, but we can definitely look at that in, in the report or further discuss later on. Um, you, you, there is a high correlation between the innovation complexity of, of your ecosystem and economic growth and many other uh, important economic indicators, right, including carbon emissions and so on. Uh, so we advocate that, and we will say for this public also thinking of your companies and your clusters, that understanding the complexity, understanding how to specialize your companies at the same time diversified is going to be very, very important to um, make strategic decisions that will pay off in, in, in the long term. In the case of IP, of course, I will also say, I will also mention that the industry is, is changing very rapidly and it's becoming very sophisticated, which also means that uh, it's hard not to have these legal summits. It's hard not to discuss the IP that is behind all of this and understand how better you use it and also the problems that arise with, with all of this. With that say, I think I went even too fast. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, this is the QR code to go to the publication. And of course, feel free to reach out if you have questions and so on. Thank you very much, Julia. Yes, thank you very much. All right, so thank you very much, uh, Julio, for your presentation. Uh, and I will actually go deeper into the case study that was forming part of the of the basically report. And I am Hakan Neusalp, an assistant professor in University of Amsterdam, Amsterdam Business School. And uh, yes, I will talk basically in summary the, the case study. There uh, I looked into the basically these four different video game hubs. At times, a disclaimer, I will go fast, which means I will, I may, you may say, hey, this is oversimplified JP. You may say, hey, this is not exactly how it happened, but I will maybe risk a bit oversimplifying just to fit in the time of the presentation. Uh, but let me start without further ado. So, well, let me just take you here from the ending point. These are four different hubs around the world of video game industry, and each has differently evolved. And that's very interesting. So on one hand, you see the blue countries. These are like kind of the founding countries of the industry, US and Japan. And if, which is very interesting, even these two countries, for example, they were specialized in different platforms. Japan was always concentrated on the console and handheld mo devices. They are very much application-specific programmers. And when you look at US, right, it's, it's kind of balanced, but PC was always there, right? And then if you look at the basically the emerging hubs relatively compared to US and Japan, consider Poland where it is very heavy in activity on PC, Right? Although, of course, it's now also you know, expanding in other platforms, also mobile, whereas compare this with Finland, where it has actually quite strong, and it is still quite strong, actually, on mobile. And that's very interesting because this kind of tells us, in this very complex industry, you have different paths that is potentially and likely uh, based on the local capabilities, local history of these countries that ended up with this picture. So just, I will go quickly, I won't explain everything, but this is just a super condensed history I tried to put together of the industry. And what we see here, one thing we see here, 
is definitely there has been constant innovation and change. So you can say, well, how can now 2024 is just so many things happening? Well, you may also think that so many things were happening in the time when the mobile devices like the iPhone was coming out, right? Or for people when even the Atari crash was happening and they were trying to move to PCs and the Amigas, whatever. And, but what is definitely sure is that this complexity is kind of increasing, right? The picture is getting more and more dense as we move here. This is something important because this tells us, well, this industry getting, is getting more complex, but it may also mean that there are also more opportunities. So it's not only a threat, but maybe it's an opportunity to think about for new, really new emerging hubs in these years, even smaller hubs, or even those hubs like Poland and Finland, at this point they are of course established, but they need to adapt maybe what is coming up next. So I will just now go very macro just to think about the industry, right? When we think about the, the unique and complex structure of the video game industry, it is, of course, a creative industry. And like many other creative industries, right, you have some certain aspects of it. Like there is a gatekeeper being a publisher in this industry generally, right? And then you have the skewed distribution of success. So this is from my studies. It's based on old data from 2000s and late 90s data, where you can see clearly, of course, as you go higher in the critic score here, right, the sales just skyrockets on average. So it's like very skewed. You are, you know, success. Only at the top success, you are generally rewarded heavily, but then otherwise, you know, it actually drops a lot. And then if you look at the industry, clearly the average project size has been increasing. This is based on the console games data between 95 and 2008. These are only games commercially released. And so you see, this, this shows this industry is actually a bit interesting compared to maybe some other industries, at least in this period, where the complexity was a bit linearly increasing, which means that uh, in a way, uh, the entry barriers were coming up, rising up over time. However, what happened over time is that actually there has been, maybe I said trio, but it's almost a quartet of developments where you had things like digital distribution, new hardware platforms and the media, optical media, or more accessible gaming tools, open code, or even knowledge sharing game jams, all these things happening, lowering entry barriers, right? which happened actually stopped this kind of this, this linear thing and allowed, right, for example, indie games to flourish. Uh, and that is very important because this industry shows that on one hand, technology and economic aspects, on one hand, maybe pushing a bit consolidation and higher entry barriers, but on the other hand, the other aspects of the industry allowing up new opportunities to come up with new studios, new game ideas, new business models, I am actually running ahead of myself, which I will summarize here. So then what these tell us at the macro level is that on one hand, we should think about the key elements of innovation and adaptation in this industry, which number one is definitely the human capital. And what is unique about this industry is that the human capital should know about there is human capital on tech programming, there is human capital on art, on design. So you have this variety of human capital you need to have. And importantly, for this study which highlighted, the local capabilities and expertise is important. This is your unique selling aspect. That is what is you are good at and what makes basically your hub will be important. And then definitely there is this whole foundation on funding, support, entrepreneurship and APR, which has somehow a bit different forms across different hubs, but it should be definitely there. Now, if you think the technology is a driving force of change, it actually brings adaptation in the content or the program and adaptation for demand and customers, right? Where with V, for example, right? At the time, people never played games, started to play games and so on. And this basically, you know, right? End up as new innovative games that kind of satisfies these two. And then also comes up with innovative business model. I mean, Shareware now is very old, but at the time it was innovative, right? And now we have new business models. So, and that's very interesting because you have innovation on so many angles coming up. Now, what I will do, I will super quickly summarize basically the story of our four hubs quickly and to point out some recent trends for Finland and Poland to come up with my takeaways, so to be on time as well. Now, if you look at the Finland story, the Finland story starts with basically with the hobby coders, with the demo scene, right? And then if you think about the demo scene, what it allowed to have is that it allowed Finland to have lots of actually very good art and programming coders right, doing hobby coding. And around the mid-90s, they started to uh, form the first commercial studios, right, and which happens to start the PC game development at the time. 
And then as something important happens to Nokia, Nokia becomes the first most important um, feature phone company. And then Nokia actually gets more um, uh, aspirant and creates the Engage, which was a, a big experiment at the time. It happens that Engage doesn't become so successful as a device, unfortunately, but the whole ecosystem Nokia allowed was worked perfectly because the mobile devices at the time were very weak. I mean, and what the, these whole demo sceners know was how to fit, you know, codes to very limited hardware. They were able to do this, like the four kilobyte competition, 16 kilobyte competition and whatnot. So they people know actually how to work with this kind of hardware. So it was a perfect fit for them to, you know, start this development. And although this was initially not a big boom, it actually needed just one external factor that, you know, the fire to start the whole whole fire basically one match and that was the Apple 3GS uh, sorry Apple 3G uh, and then the App Store and there comes the Angry Bird which is the undoubtedly the first major major success and then actually from the report which JP is a quarter the Games of Finland report you can see very clearly how the turnover goes crazy over time and also the founding of firms because these initial successes starts the whole wave of Basically, foundation, spin offs, startups, uh, entrepreneurial funders, VCs, and also government support. So, these are generally very correlated, and they generally need these large successes to start, which is a pattern also we see in the Poland case. Now, the whole support structure, this was actually quite good in the sense that Business Finland, or in the old names TechS and Finpuro, they were funding basically game development, especially in 2016, right? 2016 is the scene. Uh, program, I guess, right? So they start this very official program, and, and you can see the name in scene, right? They are referring to demo scene, so it's very clear. And, 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 and then the, the whole culture was also very supportive, it's very cooperative, it actually allows knowledge exchange, uh, the, the gaming development chapters are very open, which JP knows, but I think that is what I, I, I have read and st while studying this, and then it's very active in VC funds, City of Helsinki is very active, and Finland is number one in per million in, in, in cap per capita um, higher education for video game development in Europe. Now, this structure is great, actually, in the Finland story, but what are the current challenges we can think about is that, for example, after Apple has introduced this ap uh, application tracking transparency, that is a challenge, partially you can think, because now for user acquisition, you either need an established IP or you need scale and money, which means, actually, it's a threat, partially, for the entrepreneurship and startup, because Helsinki structure, sorry, the whole Finland structure actually, was based on startups, right, on the mobile gaming. And now, this means actually the entry barriers are potentially increasing. So that is, there, is, there needs to be a way to, you know, handle this. On the other hand, maybe also user-generated content is increasing now, right, the platforms within platforms, and there is some convergence across platforms, and that we can see, because now, not only mobile, but PC game development is increasing in the Finland. Now, Compare this to with the Poland's case, history. In the Poland's case, basically, the most commercial activity is, you know, kickstarted partially by the Copyright Act of 1994, because this gives you a legal basis, basically a way to really, you know, build on this business. Otherwise, you know, the piracy was overtaking. And, and what happens at the, at the time is that basically, uh, there was one way to create value, right, compared to, let's say, piracy at the time, and that is localization. And the good fit here was that, Basically, at the time, given that people have not have high-end PCs, people were playing text-heavy games, RPGs or the strategy. Actually, a good way to create value is that you, if you would localize these games, if you create the manual, translate the manuals, which were very heavy at the time, uh, then you can create value. And this strategy, actually, in the case of CD Projekt, which was a, a whole idea would be actually, again, using a new technology, the CD technology, as a way to enter to industry, it's... It, basically hit the bullseye, or the boo eye, for the boo is going for eyes, well, would be basically right the Baldur's Gate, being very successful with this strategy. And that allowed the Witcher's initial, right, having enough funds to start Witcher's funding. I am oversimplifying, I know everything, but uh, basically, you know, you can see very clearly, this is the, from the Polish industry report, you can see that basically how the foundings go crazy after that. Of course, the spin-offs, funding, startups, again, it is after this one big hit, but then the rest is also a big story, of course. I'm just, again, summarizing here. But what is happening here is that support, right, from the National R&D Center, from the Culture, Ministry of Culture and Heritage, 
there is lots of support, especially right from 2016 onwards after gaming. And then there is the Digital Dragons, the Technology Park itself, the agency for, for basically enterprises. The stock market, interestingly, in, in, in Poland, stock market and going to public is actually an option for many firms, which is compared to this with the Finland case, where VCs are more active, relatively. And then the education system, the high PISA scores, mathematical skills, actually brings the programming talent here. And of course, the whole literary culture, right? That has been quite used uh, in the country across developers, which is important again. It shows in the, in the for example, Poland case, it's not only about technology, or, uh, but it's also about culture. And that's very clearly also very obvious in how government is supporting. So it's also a bit of a soft power on that side. But what is now the challenge you can think? Well. Polish developers are very good. They are doing something very unusual. As a new, relatively new hub, they can play the AAA game. But now you can see that the environment is changing. Live service games. So you can also consider, OK, acquisitions are happening all around countries. But partially, maybe it is also part of this adaptation because now firms are trying to adapt to this new reality because the premium business model is actually challenging now. It can high, involve very high risks. And that's a difficult thing. And then again, Indies are very strong. The Polish Indies are very strong in digital st storefronts. But things are changing, right? There is Game Pass. People talk, is it good to be on Game Pass, bad to be on Game Pass, uh, what to do? So you can see, these are all the things that can change and disruption is going on there. Well, the next two countries, I will go very short, actually. It's like Japan is one of the founding countries. But what is interesting to see is that it is very hardware focused. So because it's one of the countries that brought lots of this hardware, you can see. And what is interesting is that Japan, its own history, if you look, it is also facing difficulties. Like, for example, in, in the mid-2000s, uh, when PlayStation 3 was released, it was right complex and difficult to develop for. And actually, many mid- and smaller-sized Japanese developers just shied away, and they moved to Nintendo DS and PS, uh, PSP, which actually was at a period of a bit more decline for the industry. But then they, they went to the mobile games, uh, and then actually they kind of now growing in PC gaming, especially in this there. And the Switch actually allowed them to have this middle cut where they can go to PC and also go to the uh, console. So you see that these things are adapting. But what is interesting in Japan's history, which is kind of very relevant and close, kind of common also to US history, they had a great anime manga industry to get human capital, the talent, and also to get the IP. So, of course, they had lots of IPs. And if you think something like a Pokemon, which is the greatest IP history, like success, I would say, well, it didn't happen by itself, right? I mean, there are these people who know how to manage IP here. So one day, now on the gaming industry side, they, they realize, OK, now we can do our IP that goes back to the other side. And now we see this is happening also here, right, in Poland with the, I don't know, cyberpunk edge runners. So it's happening on the other way around now also on the gaming industry also here. And in the US side, I mean, US has this great strength in the sense that, well, they have been both active in the console, arcade, uh, you know, early PC. They had the Vintel, if you think, and all the things around, right? 3D FX and, of course, NVIDIA and whatnot. And they have actually all the important, large, I mean, the dominant, let's say, uh, distribution platforms Steam, App Store, Google Play. And there is also lots of M&As. I think, right, the history of the video game industry, especially in the US, is a story of M&As. It's either early on with Electronic Arts, and later on now we are talking about Microsofts and stuff. But what is very interesting, I think, is this one story of Electronic Arts Foundation, which tells the story, which summarizes, I think, the industry very well. Apple goes to IPO. The marketing director is Trip Hawkins, leaves the company, opens up an office in the Sequoia uh, venture capital firm, founds Electronic Arts, and his whole idea is that game developers will be portrayed as rock stars in every game inlet. So this is the Hollywood side, this is the Silicon Valley side, this is hardware, and that is how it works. I mean, may, it may have changed over time, but that's very interesting, because that's, that's how it was also in 1982, 1984 or something, So which is kind of crazy. And of course, education side, US has lots of good universities you know, on, on the industry at this point, so it's very clear. So I will just now try to cut short at this point. OK, uh, well, what we know, how we compare. When we look at the newcomer versus you know, relatively newcomer versus established hubs, what we see is that in the newcomer hubs, the IPs are now growing, and then IP management capabilities are now improving over time. But what was very unique is that 
in each newcomer hub, the more grassroots and local capabilities were leveraged, right? If you think about the Finland, it was about basically the, the demo scene, the coder scene, plus the whole Nokia ecosystem. In the Polish case, it was initial localization and then working it through basically with the programming talent and the cultural heritage. And what was interesting also, newcomers were used new technological developments as entry points. So in the Polish case, it was the city Rom, and in the case of Finland, it was the mobile mostly. And also it is important to look at the newcomer hubs. You have targeted government or other kind of support, whereas actually in US and Japan, mostly they didn't really give targeted support that much. I mean, there are specific programs, but at the very high level, it is not there. So it's very interesting. It shows us that actually in newcomer hubs, you need actually targeted direct funding support as well. And then finally, it's very interesting to observe, at least that is the Finland and the Poland case I looked, the foreign talent is very important to keep up with the needs of the industry. And that has been the case in both places. In the established hubs, what you have then? Well, you have very strong IP management capabilities. I mean, Nintendo is practically Disney of the video games. They are master of IP management, right? And what is interesting, these both hubs, they had a very clear crossover skill transfer between hardware and animation industries. In the Japan case, it's uh, anime manga plus, you know, all these uh, microelectronic skills. And in the US, it is, of course, the hardware, Intels and whatnot, plus the Hollywood animation plus, uh, if you will, CGI animation plus the, the entertainment. But historically, they had not so much target support. It's now changing. For example, I heard that Japan is now starting an indie, indie support grant or something. I, it was on Twitter. I'm not sure about details. But you see, they're also adapting. They're also trying to adapt what's happening now. So takeaways, finally. There are unique paths available for new hubs to emerge and succeed in this complex industry. And one thing is that it's about leveraging unique cultural, technological, industrial background for each country. But this is actually not the same between emergent and uh, old hubs, right? Old hubs were, as I said, hardware plus animation, but it's not the same for the emergent hubs. It's much more unique. And then this means that you should consider what your hub can uniquely contribute, especially about human capital in the form of, if you think human capital is tech plus art, creative talent, I know it's oversimplifying. Think about it. In Finland's case, you had the people on the, on the coding scene, demo scene, that were specialized on art and the programming, right? And if you think about the, uh, the Polish case, if you think about that, you have the programmers and then you have the people who are leveraging basically this cultural, literary heritage, right? You can see in each country, and in Japan it's very clear, anime, manga, and, and the same with US, with CGI, and so on. <clears throat> and again, this infrastructure of support, entrepreneurship, funding, IPR, it is a bit different in each country, but it's important to have each, each of them, basically, and to see actually how you can leverage them, because this is the infrastructure you can't go without. Okay, uh, what is very interesting to observe is also these previous factors, also historically, draw this platform specializes. In, despite now, there is an increasing convergence right across these platforms we see, also because of the recent trends on whatever, cross-play or, or, or new business models free to play. There is still this platform specializations persist, and that comes from historically developed capabilities, how, what people were doing, right? And we can see also this global democratization of game development e will continue, which means there will be new entry points for new hubs. Think about the user-generated content trend that's just increasing right now with the platform within platforms. And this, for these countries, especially very new hubs maybe, it's important to think about seed funding because in each of these examples, we saw that the funding came after major successes came, which makes sense, but maybe for the very emerging hubs, it makes sense to have some seed funding to able to find this one hit game. Uh, yeah, it's a bit more VC style here, but you know, as a, as a, if you can do this as a, as a government, as a, you know, why not? And then education seems, I mean, that's, that's important. It's an like industry first and foremost based on human capital. I don't want to enter about talks about AI, but human capital is there. It's going to stay there. Education is key. And then IP is definitely important. It's last but not least. But now we see that actually IP is not only borrowed from other things. It is increasingly that it's the last two, three years we see very big successes coming out from video games to actually movies, animation, and so on. I'm sorry if I took so much time, but thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for the very inspiring speeches and very energetic speeches at the same time. 
I'm Yari Pekka Kaleva, uh, Managing Director of the European Games Developer Federation, ECDF. Uh, we represent 24 trade associations across Europe now that Estonia joined us from 23 different European countries. And our main focus is on, first of all, fighting for access to talent for the game developers, and fighting for access to funding for the game developers, and fighting for the access to the top of the value chain for the game developers. And in that context, we are constantly involved in the debate around European funding policies and European innovation policies in Brussels. And in that capacity, I'm here today uh, asked to give a short industry perspective on the two presentations we have just heard. And um, uh, generally speaking, yeah, thank you so much for doing this great work. Uh, building a research on the video game industry ecosystem is something that is really, really lacking. Uh, there are, however, per perhaps few points that uh, we could have a closer look on. And the first of them is that you mentioned um, like the size of the video game productions is increasing. And EGDF is every year aggregating data from all the European countries on the size of the video game industry. And we know that there is about 5,500 game developer studios in Europe employing over 85,000 people. This means that average game developer studio size is 15 persons. And um, knowing that most of the European game developer studios are micro companies or small studios, well, perhaps the size, the median size might be even lower. And in that context, if you are able to master uh, technological innovation, business innovation, and content innovation, you are as a small studio with the right tools, with the right service providers, can survive in the markets and do amazing products, as Hogan was mentioned already. And, um, and that's the key. Games are a combination of uh, cutting-edge technology, clever business models, and artistic content. And far too often, we are only focusing on technological innovation, while we should be also discussing about business innovation and content innovation. And if you are remembering two things uh, from my presentation, those would be, the first of all, uh, it's not only uh, technology that is striving for a change. It's actually the content here. This is the driver of a change in the video games industry ecosystem. If we think about, um, for example, uh, processors uh, you know, powers in early 1990s and late 1990s, they were driven by the video game sector, pushing for the demand higher with ever increasing demand from the games. We saw the same on uh, the 2000s with uh, uh, capabilities of the mobile phones. Games were the driver of the development of the mobile phone capacities at that moment. And, and also, of course, uh, we see now that the internet connections are driven by the demand for the content. Uh, not just games, but also the video on demand services. So the content is on the driving seat, creating the pressure for technology and business model to answer the those challenges. And the second thing to remember, uh, from my presentation is that it's not enough to have focus on technological innovation. You need all of these three uh, capabilities. And if you use the Finnish example here, if we start uh, from the demo scene you mentioned, absolutely, we had content innovation. We had these highly talented young people making really, really innovative games in the demo parties and building the talent base, building the technological capabilities to actually exploit uh, the technological uh, possibilities. So here we got the Remedy. And from Remedy, we started to have Nokia, and then we saw Rovio emerging in Finland. And uh, because of the Nokia mobile phone experience, as you mentioned, uh, then when Apple uh, caused the disruption in the business innovation side with uh, digital mobile distribution, and Nokia went down, thanks, and that was good news for the Finnish games industry, I would say. Um, then we saw Rovio skyrocketing. But where the supercell came was that uh, actually Germans went to G-Star. And from G-Star in South Korea, they noticed that there is this new business model called free-to-play. And they brought that model to Germany and introduced browser games like um, with big point, Gameforce. We are now in 2009, 2008, and something like that. And those became highly successful. And then the Finns went to, uh, to Gamescom and noticed, hmm, interesting business model. Let's uh, experiment a little with that. 
and yeah, Supercell experimented and brought that business model to mobile. So it was business innovation that really took the Finnish games ecosystem to the next level. And in this context, it's important to remember that, yes, these were local capabilities, but this business innovation was a global capacity, global knowledge sharing in the video game industry community. So in the video game sector, local truly is global. And events like this are absolutely crucial for knowledge sharing and this kind of uh, innovations to happen. And I would argue that even more in the future, when we have more cross-border remote work, more capacities to collaborate across border through uh, different kinds of virtual forums, the global innovation ecosystem and knowledge sharing environment is going to play even more important role. But at the same time, you need the local talent. And that's the tricky balance you have to find. And one other thing, um, if we deep dive into this way of thinking, we have one of the big challenges at the moment is that these are in silos in every possible aspect. If we start from the talent, here we have art school, artists. Here we have technological universities, coders. And here we have business schools. And the video game developer studio is the one that brings them together and breaks these silos. And that's where the magic happens. And breaking this kind of uh, thinking that there's only technology or only art or only business is absolutely crucial for the video game industry. Unfortunately, this is absolutely everywhere. Also on the public support side, here we have cultural funding for the content. Tax breaks in France and Germany, for uh, grants in Germany. Here we have R&D support, uh, Business Finland in uh, Finland, for example. And here we have SME support, entrepreneurial support, a little bit of R&D support if you are really innovative like Business Finland is, but they are in silos. And it's a really, really fundamental level because even the, uh, I think the founding agreement of the European Union states that you shall not mix R&D funding with the content funding. So no benchmarked for uh, European business uh, public support system because ideally you would be able to combine them into one thing again. And that's the structural science games industry is facing. And even if you go to the, from funding to the value chain part, here we have um, a platform censorship. Like what kind of content is allowed on the platforms? Here we have uh, data access into different platforms. Uh, on Apple, as you mentioned, you have not have a good access to the advertisement data at the moment. On cloud gaming platforms, you have a very pro poor access to player data, and that is limiting the innovation there. And then on the business innovation side, you would not have access to payment data in all platforms. You cannot choose your service uh, providers in the different platforms. And those restrictions combined create uh, the limitations for the innovation environment. So what we need is a really holistic perspective in a games. A perspective that is not starting from our way of thinking that it's only about code or technology. We need to acknowledge the role of the business and art. And we need to acknowledge that they, these three perspectives are united in a game, in a single product or service that needs to break these silos in the thinking how it works. And we need a coherent regulatory framework to make that happen. Um, so, do we have time for the questions or how does it work? Well, uh, hello. We still have time for some questions, so please uh, ask uh, if uh, if anyone wants to ask a question or two. Yeah, at, at least one we can ask. Yeah. Uh, so. Anyone has questions? If you don't want to ask them now, you can approach our speakers. They will be more than happy to talk to you. They will be here for at least today and tomorrow, hopefully, uh, most of them. <laughs> so uh, please grab them and talk to them about uh, philosophy of technology, of society, of, of legal philosophy. Mm -hmm.